figure of speech. Okay, so now we have sort of two questions concerning the war in Ukraine. Um, so first, um, Yanuin from Mexico slash Poland says, um, so I currently live in Poland, and as is known, there is a war in Ukraine, our neighboring country. Um, it's reported that more than 2 million Ukrainians, mainly women and children, have emigrated to Poland. My question is, what changes are expected in one to two generations from a biological and genetic perspective among the descendants of those who experienced the war? Um, and so then relatedly, we have a question from Maxim, who is in Kyiv currently, who asks, um, how do you advise me to perceive my enemies, the Russians who attacked my motherland and killed thousands of people, if I understand that they are what their genes and environment made them, but it is very likely that I will be drafted to kill them? Could my beliefs get in the way of my survival and need to be changed so I don't go insane? Or can you imagine being able to understand and empathize with your enemies while simultaneously mercilessly taking their lives? Whoa, well, those are two brutally heavy duty questions. The first one uh, conveniently brings us back to like, how do you raise kids? How do you raise kids in a world of trauma and deprivation and bombs dropping on you, and that's certainly relevant, not just to Ukraine, but another corner of the planet right now. Um, it's interesting, early in the Ukrainian war, I was doing a whole bunch of like remote podcast teaching things with military psychiatrists in Ukraine about trauma and stress and about psychiatrists in the general population. And you go through, okay, how do we handle combat trauma and what's it doing to the brain? And at the end of it, what all these folks would get around to asking is, what's this doing to our kids? How much is this screwing them up? And I think very tragically, the answer is it's having a pretty bad impact. Adversity early in life, there is a literature through the ceiling showing how it increases the likelihood of adult antisocial violence, adult mood disorders, addictive behavior, unsafe sex during adolescence, unstable relationships, all of that. And... I think early life trauma, whether it is writ local in the form of an abusive parent or whether it's writ grand on the scale of like an abusive neighboring country that's destroying your world, I think this is going to have a very bad impact. Amid that, individual differences, there are ways to intervene, there's modifying variables coming out the other end of this with stability and social support and all that sort of thing is obviously a good thing. Early life adversity and risk of depression, for example, an adult mediating factor is social support. So all the obvious stuff, if you have had unspeakably bad luck as a child coming through this war, uh, the outcome is likely to be better if your luck is a whole lot better afterward. In terms of the question of whether it becomes multi-generational, this is a whole world now of non-genetic transmission of traits multi-generationally. And this is one which was first shown descendants of Holocaust survivors have epigenetic changes and aspects of how their bodies work. And essentially along the lines of vulnerability that winds up being a milder version of what hellish experience induced in your parent or grandparent generation. Uh, for people who study it, there's two mechanisms that get attention for multi-generational transmission of traits. Uh, the better studied one is behavioral. Early life trauma causing epigenetic changes in your brain, and as a result, you behaviorally, psychologically become a different sort of adult than you would have been otherwise, and of a type that replicates this phenotype in your offspring. And thus they grow up replicating the phenotype, replicating, bringing about the epigenetic changes in your developing child so that as an adult, they will have some of those traits and thus be likely to pass them on. And that's basically a way of describing the pathology of cultural transmission. 
you raise your children so that they will grow up to epigenetically have the same sort of brain that you do to pass it on. The much less understood mechanism for it um, is epigenetics can actually cause changes in eggs and sperm. Dogma used to be that epigenetic markers would be deleted, say, when forming those cells, and more and more it's clear that a certain amount of those can be transmitted that way. So, early life trauma, changing your brain in a way that we understand epigenetically, potentially lifelong, not inevitably, if you luck out with the right interventions, potentially multi-generational through both behavioral mechanisms and, as we see increasingly, actual transmission of epigenetic traits via sperm and egg. Okay, so that's terrible news, which transitions us to the next question from Keith, which is just as horrible. That is, okay, there's no free will, and so blame makes no sense. How am I supposed to sort of reconcile this in a world in which monstrous damage is being done to an innocent country by an invader, um, in which, in the case of this particular person, they may well wind up being, you know, in the front lines having to try to kill one of these people. What, what do you do with this? This is, like, <laughs> immensely difficult. What we know at this point is there's all sorts of heartwarming ways in which you see in old age, ex-enemies will reconcile and they're are some incredibly moving examples of that. More powerfully, for my money, there's examples where combatants at the time that they are combatants wind up with ways of, in a sense, developing truces, bottom-up truces, best studied during World War I, during the trench warfare. Famously, the Christmas truce of 1914, where top-down, the powers that be said, we are going to have a truce during Christmas dinner across the trenches and go collect your dead. And famously, the soldiers refused to go back to fighting for hours or days afterward, intermingled and no man's land in between. But in some ways, even more amazingly, examples of spontaneous emergence of truces across the lines. They're ones that are like miraculously interesting examples of self-organizing emergent systems that figure out how to not actually try to kill each other. And that's phenomenal. But in retrospect, a whole lot of it had to do with shared religion. This was predominantly British and German Protestant groups, uh, stable trench lines. So for weeks and weeks, you hear the guy, the enemy guy on the other side, who sings the same song every morning while they're all like shaving, and they become humans, they become real to you. An ironic piece of it um, documented is that a lot of the time when like the Germans and the British troops were fraternizing across the trenches, they were often saying, this is ridiculous, we're fighting each other, we should both be fighting the French, those damn French traditional enemies of both. Okay, so that's great. But amid that, sort of what do you begin to see? How do you start seeing the person on the other side as like a human rather than an enemy? Another observation that came out of World War I is you looked at the letters soldiers, trench warfare soldiers were writing home, the ones who were in the trenches, as opposed to the ones who were doing infrastructure support or the ones even further behind with the artillery. And what you would see is the further people were from the trenches, the more likely they were writing letters filled with jingoistic, propagandistic crap, and we Brits are trying to do in the Kaiser, and is it? And you look at guys in the front, line, front lines, and none of them were writing stuff like that. And in fact, you got soldiers there explicitly writing, I'm so damn tired of hearing about propagandists, about the Kaiser or the Prime Minister in England or all of that. 
like the guy across the trenches is another guy like me and he's brave and all he wants to do is go back to their family and I'm so damn sick of this propaganda. And in lots of ways, if you were fighting in the trenches, you and the guys on the other side were aligned in at least two fundamental ways, that you were aligned because you were hungry and lice and rats and freezing and all of that, and that became the common en enemy. And when looking at a lot of these spontaneous truces that formed, very frequently the other common en enemy were the officers who would show up and say, unless you start shooting for real, I will shoot you right now. Who's an us? Who's a them? And for people in the trenches, thems were the damn rats reading your food or the damn officers trying to break up the spontaneous truces you had formed. Okay, so all of that in the context now of a very different type of fighting, trench warfare, even though some of that in southeastern Ukraine was a feature during the first couple of winters of the war, you see some very revealing stuff. There's this military historian, David Grossman, who wrote a really powerful, really moving book called On Killing. Um, he is now long career as a colonel in the military, and now he's a professor of military history at West Point, and documenting um, how easy is it for people to kill somebody else in battle, and showing through fatality statistics, wound st statistics as to whether or not soldiers fired their, their guns in battle, things of that sort, what you see is people in the back lines out operating artillery 20 miles back have zero problems doing that. People on naval ships, people dropping bombs from 10,000 feet, that sort of thing. And as you get closer and closer to the front lines, you see more inhibition of people actually killing the enemy, more circumstances in which people's guns misfire, things of that sort. And what you finally see, the biggest, biggest inhibitions in warfare was hand-to-hand -hand combat. You're not shooting somebody even from 10 feet away. You were trying to run a bayonet through their stomach. And that's where you see the most inhibitions about it. That's where you see some of the highest rates of combat trauma, PTSD. And what we now know from drone operators, it's not just the trauma of somebody trying to kill you. It's the trauma of you trying to do that to a fellow human being. And if you can see their eyes and their facial expression, it is a whole different experience than dropping a bomb. What Grossman then spends a lot of time on is essentially reviewing the history of military strategy of desensitizing soldiers to doing that, to turning it into a video game, to turning it into where they are so different from us, they hardly count as the same species, or they are not a whole lot different from a bunch of pixels on this video game that we trained you on trying to counter that tendency. And that has been a feature of militaries all along. Okay, nonetheless, you're sitting there and it's your country that's been invaded and you're in there fighting and, you know, ridiculous, fatuous nonsense like damaging people only become that way because they were damaged gets you only so far. The knowledge that an awful lot of these Russian soldiers are doing this to have gotten out of prison or were drafted and disproportionately in Russia, apparently, from some of the more minority-filled republics out in the boondocks, showing some real Slavic sort of chauvinism there, or very often because you're poor and this is going to help you support your family. We're taking orders and all of that. I don't know how much that can get you to. They had no control over this. They turned out this way because of things they had no control over. I don't know how far that can get. I sure don't know how far the knowledge that 50 years from now or Christmas dinner next year from now, we may find a way to see the humanity in each other. And the following their or just following orders won't get you past the problem that you got to have the same exact thinking with respect to Putin. It's not by chance that he somehow became the person that he is. 
how to reconcile that with the fact that you may be asked at points to try to kill somebody with your hands at close distance, seeing their eyes, finding the pictures of their loved ones stuffed in their pockets when you're going through their corpse afterward. How you do that, I sure as hell don't know. And anything I would have to say about that, like borders on the offensive, insofar as I'm sitting here in my home looking at my child who's safe and who I love and with my wife nearby and knowing that, yeah, I'm sitting here and spouting off crap about this. Like for people who are actually experiencing this, I do not know how you reconcile those different human propensities without being shredded by it.